all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. good? Good. Today we're in Genesis 1. We'll be looking at verses 24 uh, to 27. And looking at this interesting Hebrew word, um, uh, uh, I pronounce it salam, but it's actually stelam. Everyone say stelam. Stelam. It's the Hebrew word for image. How many know that there is a battle for our image? Yeah, it's called, it's called branding. It's called billions of dollars that are, sp- that are spent worldwide, especially in our country, to get you to bear the image of a corporation or a political party, to get you to say, this is who I am. When really, most of us don't really know who, who we are, which this is why our mission here at Seattle Bible Center is to awaken people to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. This, this, this is what Paul said. Paul said, I preach to awaken hearts that every person would know who they are in and through Christ Jesus. And this is our, this is our, our, our desire. We think that Jesus so loved the world that he died on a cross that, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. We believe that God loves the world, that he died for the world. He wants to save the world. We believe that what Jesus did on the cross was enough and we believe that a lot more people should be loved by Jesus, should know Jesus and should know who they are in and through him. That means that we're not here just for us. That means that we're not here just to get our back scratched. We're not here just because I like the way he preaches and it makes me laugh. Uh-huh. He's silly sometimes. No, no, no. We're not here just for us. We are here for him and to partner with him to get his image on everything and everyone. I think it was Sprite, Sprite that used to have like the marketing thing. It was like, you know, something is nothing. Like image is, image is nothing, thirst is everything. Obey your thirst. How many of you guys remember that? It, image is nothing, thirst is everything. You know, obey your thirst. You know. But they're kind of hypocrites. Because that entire campaign was all about one thing. Their image. Their image. In fact, um, As we live our lives, all of this revelation, all of this experience, all of these church services, all of your day in, day out, working a job, doing your thing, doing you, it's really all about image. And today we're going to be looking at image. Now, if you're new here, um, uh, we are in the book of Genesis. We've been in it for three months. We're going to be in it for quite a long time. The reason why I, I sense that, the reason why I discern that we're going to be in Genesis for quite a long time is that because we've been in it for three months and we're still in the first chapter. So this is going to take a little while. I'm super excited uh, because we're, we're, we're in day six. We're going to spend two Sundays on day six. We're going to spend a day on day seven, which is amazing. You're going to love day seven. And then we're going to get into the Garden of Eden. And we're going to look at the two trees. And, um, and it's, going to be, it's going to be wild. And you say, why are we doing this? Why would we as a church take the next few years to study the book of Genesis? Pastor Darren, don't you realize we're in the end times? Okay, well, this is, this, is, this is what I believe. I believe that for the believer, there is no game over. So I'm not planning for the game over. What am I planning for? I'm planning for the new beginning. If you want to understand the end, you better understand the beginning. Why? Because when you get to the end of the book, it loops back to the beginning. 
And then we get to rule and reign with Christ. We have the restoration. The new heavenly Jerusalem comes down from heaven, kisses the earth. Everything gets fixed. To, Satan gets judged and thrown into the lake of fire. And, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's awesome. And it's intergenerational. And it's intergalactic. And it's, calm, uh, you, know, uh, you know, everyone say, like, like why, why, is the universe, why is the universe so, so, so big? We don't know. But one day you're going to find out different sermon. Okay, here we go. So, um, so we've been studying the origin story, our origin, our origin story. And what we learned is on, on day one, God said, let there be light. And we, we, all of a sudden we saw the first realm of time that was created. He separated the light from the darkness and the, the light he called day, the darkness he called, he called night. And in day two, um, we see that God comes and establishes um, what some translations would call the dome the Hebrew word rakia, which is this place of atmosphere. And we see that God begins creating um, this womb. And so God begins creating these realms, okay? Um, and then he, uh, within the rakia, he puts um, the cosmos and the, the sun, the moon, um, and the stars. And, and then all of a sudden, he separates the waters. And from the grounds come forth the mountains. And there are mountains, there are valleys, and there are waters. And then from the earth begins to spring forth vegetation. And there's all this clothing and dirt and soil that begins to come up over all, 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 all the, 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 dry, the dry land. And then on day five, we see that, um, that, that, the, that the seas, he creates life within the sea, seas. And there's, they're teeming with life and abundance and all these sea creatures, including, yep, the Hebrew word for sea monsters. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, good times. That was that week. The kids had a lot of fun that week downstairs. Sea monsters, ah, right? And they weren't monstrous. They weren't villainous. There was no sin yet. Yet. So these things were basically like submarines. <laughs> Hold on tight. Here we go. So then, um, yep. Okay. Day five, we're doing good. Okay. And then also, let's not forget the, the creatures of the air. So there's sea creatures. And then also from the seas come forth the birdies. Okay. Yep. From the seas come forth the birdies. You read that, that from the sea comes forth the creatures of the air. One of the little details I didn't get in Sunday school. So anyways, we're having fun. Yes, your children are learning the same thing that you are. They are studying origin. And uh, we, this is a study that we're doing across the fabric of the church. Why? Because when we forget where we came from, we'll get, dece we'll get deceived and forget where we're going. We as a nation, we have forgotten where we have come from. We as a church have forgotten where we've come from. And that's why many people are struggling with, where are we going? You shouldn't need a prophetic conference to figure out where you're going. All you need is your Bible. Okay, so everyone got your Bibles? Good. All right, here we go. All right, Genesis 1. We're in the sixth day, you guys. The sixth day. Christian's favorite number, six. Okay, January's, <laughs> Genesis, not January. We're in the book of January this morning. All right, Genesis 1, 24. And God said, everybody say, and God said. Why did God say? Because there is never a manifestation unless there is first a declaration. Everyone say Declaration. This is why we begin our first quarter each year with Declaration Conference. We always have Bobby Connor come in, and, and he's, a, he's, a, he's a prophet in this house, and we honor him as a father here. And so, yep, coming up in March, we got Bobby Connor coming. We got Charlie Sham coming. We got Liz Wright just confirmed. We got Bonnie Shaw to come. We got Steve Swanson coming for a whole week. We got Troy Brewer coming. Um, why? Because we're nice people. <laughs> just, just, I'm just kidding. We love Troy. He's going to be a lot of fun. In fact, I'm going to be with uh, Troy uh, next week. I'm, I'll be at their, uh, de their declaration, their version of Declaration conference, um, and uh, uh, Patricia will be there, and Todd White, I haven't met him, he'll be there, um, the, the, one, uh, the one prophet, I always forget his name, he's like, a, he's the real Hebrew prophet, what's his name, um, oh, come on, you guys, all right, here we go, <laughs> it, it'll come, not, you know what I'm saying, it's the one guy, no, not Jonathan Khan. he's definitely a Hebrew prophet, but, are we online right now? All right, it doesn't matter. Let's just get to the text. Okay, and I was saying, God said, 
Like, are we on the earth? Then just read the Bible. Okay. And God said, he made a declaration, there's going to be a manifestation. Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their time, according to their kind. God descends. He comes down into the sixth day and works with the earth. And we see in this instance that God does not create something out of nothing, but he begins to participate with his creation, not because he needs to, not because he needs the energy of the earth or because he needs to borrow anything. He's fully capable within himself to create something out of nothing. And yet because he's a father and because he's a creator, he loves to partner with his creation. So we see this is a fascinating thing within the land-dwelling creatures that we're going to see in a second, that we see that God descends, he comes upon his creation, and then the earth begins to bring forth living creatures according to their kind. On the fifth day, from the oceans came forth the birds. I see them coming dancing. I see them twirling out of the air and, and flapping their wings for the very first time and then taking flight within the grace of God and having to fly for about, you know, okay, okay. And then we see here, um, uh, uh, the fifth day is the birds come out. The sixth day, we see creation begins to come forth um, from, uh, from the earth. Now look at, it says livestock, creepy things, not creepy things, not like Halloween-y things, but creeping things, Okay, and wild beasts of the earth according to their kind. And so it was so. Verse 25, and God made the wild beasts of the earth according to their kinds, domestic animals according to their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind. So there's not a separation according to species. There's a separation according to domestic animals, wild herd animals that oftentimes would serve as prey. And number three, wild predatory animals. And God looks at it, he sees it, and he says, it is tov. This is the word for it. This is fitting. It's pleasing. It's practical. It's functional. And it's beautiful. This is the Hebrew word tov or good. This is Good. He approves of it, um, but he's not done yet. Isn't this fascinating? That now we have this, this he, he, he created these realms, and now he has filled these realms, and they are teeming with life and energy and abundance. You've got beauty, and you've got all these creatures, and they're all just like tweeting and stuff. They're just all like, you know, whales and dinosaurs, and it's just like... <laughs> Okay, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad I'm enjoying his creation right now. All right, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> okay, all right. And God looks at all of it and is like, this, God looks at it, he's like, this is stinking amazing. Like, I am the man, right? And then, but then he, he's not done yet. On, on the sixth day, he, he's, he's, he's not done. And look, at it says, and then God said, and this is fascinating here. It says, and God said, verse 26, let us. Let us. And this is what he says here. Um, let us communicating this revelation that with in the context of community, our God creates. And within the context of community, in collaboration, he says, it is time for my masterpiece creation. Let us do it together. Anything worth creating is worth creating the way our Father created in community and collaboration. This is going to be so beautiful. This is going to be so amazing. Why wouldn't I want to include you? You guys excited about this too? Or yeah? yeah? <laughs> I'm like hyperventilating. I'm like, yeah. Just look at the person next to you if you're married and just say, uh, this is going to be so amazing. Or even if you're not married, this is platonic. Say, uh, this is going to be so amazing. This is going to be so glorious. No, really do this. Look at the person next to you. Say, this is going to be so amazing. This is going to be so glorious. I want to include you. How many of you meant that? 
Hey, listen, uh, this is your year. Listen, I, I understand isolation, you know, I understand it, but this is your year to figure out community. And we're, we're here to help. Here in a couple of weeks, we're going to be launching all of our groups. We've got a bunch of new groups. We've got a bunch of old groups. We've got a bunch of awesome groups. They're all awesome. And we're going to present an, an opportunity for you to connect in person or for you to connect online. I mean, we've tried to come up with everything so that there's no excuse to, to not connect. And I, I really want for you to go into this year saying, um, this year, I'm going to be seen. I'm going to be heard. I'm going to be known. Why? Because I really want for you to create really cool stuff. And I don't want you to do it alone. Why? Because dreams, let's go with destiny. Destiny dies in isolation. People say to me, I'm I'm gonna write a book. I'm gonna write a book. Uh, Yeah, how long you been saying that? 45 years. Well, why are you still saying it? You're not gonna write a book. You're all talk. What's gonna make the difference? You're gonna have to interrupt that pattern of all proclamation but no manifestation by creating the way he created, by honestly being able to say, let us. Can you honestly say this morning, let us? Let us create? Can you honest, is there an us or is there just a you? You're like, well, I'm married, so of course there's a, that doesn't mean nothing. I know people that are married and they are more lonely than, than anyone. Just because you're married doesn't mean you're in community and that you're living life truly connected. How do I know that? I've got a television. That's like the, that's like the plot line of every sitcom, right? So a, a family that's married and he's a criminal and she's an FBI agent and there's no togetherness in anything. She's a serial killer and he, he, whatever. Like this is the plot of every movie, every TV show. You got somebody that should be one flesh and they are anything but. And this is even the same within many marriages within the church. And this is our year to be like, I'm going to do something really cool. I want to include you because I really, really need you, baby. Or I know God's going to do something through you, babe. God's going to do something so amazing with you. And I want you to know I'm in it with you. You're not in this alone. I, there's going to be some ups. There's going to be some downs. I'm in this with you. I know you are in this with me. How many of you remember when you got married? And you said some crazy things, didn't you? You said some crazy things when you got married. You said things like in sickness and in health. And then you got married and you were like, nope, the doctor says you need to quarantine in that room for two weeks and I don't want to see you, smell you, hear you. Get behind me, Satan. (laughs) No, you said in sickness and in health, in poverty and in, listen, we don't get an excuse just to get a divorce just because the stuff hits the fan. This is our year to say, let us, to renew covenant to renew covenant with God, to, re, to renew covenant within our marriage. Just say, this is going to be the best year yet because this is the year when I am in strong relationship with Jesus, strong relationship with my bride, and strong relationship with his church. Let us, let us, let us. We're going to do crazy, cool, amazing things, and we're going to celebrate each other. And there will be some times when we have to mourn with each other, but there's going to be some times when we get to party together, and we're going to be together, 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 because that is the culture of heaven. The culture, in hell, no one's together. They're all suffering in isolation. Why? Because isolation is one of the biggest forms of torment. If you really want to be tormented, then be isolated. But if you want to discover everything that Jesus has in store for you, then be willing to form relationship with very imperfect people that are in process to discover their real salem, to discover their real image. Isn't, aren't we all in the same boat with this? What is my real image? Who am I for real? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Darren, what's up? That was good. Thanks, bro. Here we go. Let us, Father, Son, Spirit, the glorious community of the Trinity, make mankind in our image. And we declare in his image. They say, let us create mankind in our image, in our likeness, and let them have complete authority. Everyone say complete authority. 
Yep, over the fish of the sea. This is the text that I use every time I go fishing. I declare to this fish, I have complete authority over the fish of the sea by my life. By my life. I actually know a friend that, that went fishing with a fairly well-known minister and he outfished everyone and he said that he did it supernaturally. I don't know if it's true or not, but he said it was. He said that the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the tame beasts and over all of the earth and everything that creeps on the earth. It says here, um, let us make mankind. And this is the word Adam, which can be translated, yes, man, uh, but it does not have the definite article here, um, which means that it is not referring to gender. It is not referring to all this authority and all this glory and all this approval that at this moment, this is the creation of gender Adam, this is what Moses does. He declares a big category. For example, this is what Moses does when he says, Bereshit um, Elohim um, uh, bara, and, and, he, and he declares the, the, the manifestation of the heavens and the earth, and then Moses rewinds and gives us the details. What is happening here is he declares that this is what God did. He gives us the overviewing category, and then he's going to rewind. He's going to begin to give us the details of how God created man, and it did begin with gender-specific male and who we refer to as Adam. But here within this text, we see that there is the creation of both male and female created in the image and representation, the resemblance of God. This is the first Adam, the first mankind, our first parents that came um, from the earth and and with some very specific um, abilities. They were different from the rest of the animals. Don't believe the lie out there that you're just another animal. We're just animals. This is, this is a big thing. I find it so hypocritical within our culture that we want to be so preachy against something like racism while in the next sentence saying that you're just an animal and evolved from an ape. In fact, Darwin's survival of the fittest, if you read the entire name of, of that first book, which I don't have it, so here, it was all about the superior race. It was a book to undergird racism to basically say that through evolution comes forth eventually over time the perfect race and all of the other races will over time eventually be eradicated from the earth through natural selection. Yes, Darwin, the guy where we get our science from, was not building a science. He was catalyzing racism. The Bible says people matter. People matter greatly. They matter a lot more than animals. You know, the, the, uh, people freaking out all the time. Oh, the lobsters were screaming. The lobster, the, the lobsters scream. We need to save the lobsters. People laying down their life to break into laboratories to save frogs. Why? Because we're just another animal. You're not just another animal. You got a thing called a personality. You got this thing called a moral conscience. You've got a compass within you. Listen, my dog is not at home right now trying to make wise choices based off of what the word of God says. My, bo- my dog is like, I'm going to choose to not to dig under that fence because if I do, master will beat me. <laughs> just, just kidding. I don't beat my dog. <laughs> or do I? Like, this, the, like, like, like the, 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 the difference between a good animal and a bad animal is if they have been trained. They don't have an inherent moral compass, but you do because you're not an animal. You're not an animal. Animals don't look like God. Animals do stupid stuff like eat their own poo. They do stupid stuff. I'm not saying that the, 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 the animal's stupid, but it's an animal. And you're not an animal. And that's why conversation matters. That's why care matters. That's why worship matters. There are things that only we can do. Why? Because he took great pride when he said, let us create the first Adam. Let us create mankind in our image, in our resemblance. Now, this is fascinating. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
I'm going to hit on two verses, 45 and 47. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, an individual personality. And the last Adam, speaking of Jesus, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. He continues in verse 47. The first man was out of the earth, made of dust, earthly-minded. The second man is the Lord and came out of heaven. So here we have... Adam and Eve, created from the dust, created in the image and likeness of God. Okay? This is amazing. Us, created in the image of him. But then we kind of screwed everything up. I don't know if you know the story, or I don't know if you've noticed lately on TV, but everything is still a little screwed up. Like, really screwed up. Like, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but things are really, really screwed up. Okay, good. I'm glad we established that. Things got, now, why? Why is everything the way it is? Because of Genesis 3, and we're going to get there. Because of Genesis 3. What it is, is it's sinfulness. It's rebellion against God. It's this place that I'm sure none of us have ever done this. But God says, this is my way. Do it my way. And then Adam and Eve said, yeah, that's all good. But I think I'll do it my way. Good thing that was their problem, not ours. Amen? All right, good. Mankind screwed everything up like, like we were created to be image bearers, to be little revealers, to be prototypes, to be these earthly prototypes that reveal the complexity. Okay, pause. Some things can't really be taught verbally. Some things have to be shown and demonstrated. For example, try to teach your kids how to tie their shoes, but just try to tell them verbally. It's really, really hard. And, and, some, of, and some of our teachers here are so amazing, they could actually do it. But for me, okay, I would actually have to say, come here, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. And this is what God does in the creation of mankind as he says, I'm going to teach who I am but I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you who I am through my offspring. That when you see my offspring, you will see the complexity of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit revealed in flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Image. Image is everything. Image is everything. Image is everything you need to care about your image. Why? Because people are going to look at you and they're going to see something else. And you get to choose where you point their attention to. Okay. God says, I'm going to establish this through this first prototype, through the, through the Adam, who mankind screws everything up. Then what does God do? He sends a second Adam. So we are created in the image and likeness of God. Amen? What does he do with his son? He creates his son in the image and likeness of man. God became flesh and dwelt. Is your nose bleeding yet or just me? It's like, oh my God. Okay. In the beginning, the first Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. The second Adam became flesh and took on the image and likeness of man. To do what? To do it right. To redo it and to undo the effects of the curse that brought about great separation between unholy man whose image is radically fractured and to make possible a covenant people with a restored image so that we can properly represent who God is on the earth through us and have the audacity to call ourselves the body of Jesus himself. You get that? How many of you believe that we are the body of Christ? Now, how many of you, of you actually believe that we are the body of Christ? What does it have everything to do with? Image. That when people, that Jesus, this is how Jesus said it. This is really offensive. I haven't said this yet. If you've seen me, you've seen him. I am the Polaroid picture of who he is. I am the MP3. That when you have heard my voice, you have heard 
his voice. And you guys, this is what God is doing on the earth. He is abolishing a people that subscribe their worth and value from a system and awakening us to our identity and destiny with the living person of Christ who instantaneously reunited us and reconciled us to Heavenly Daddy to heavenly papa so that we can be regenerated so that we can be transformed in his image and likeness for this purpose it is important that we host holy spirit so that the voice of the lord is resounding within us so that ultimately my voice is great you love darren's voice yes but you don't need darren's voice no why because you've got a shepherd him I don't have to be your middleman. Why? Because Jesus abolished that system. He became your high priest so that I don't have to be. So that if we were, heaven forbid, to get scattered like they were in the book of Acts, you would be okay, I would be okay, and the kingdom would expand because Holy Spirit would be inside of you revealing who you are in him and revealing who he is in you. There was no handbooks in the book of Acts. There was like the Torah. Here you go. (laughs) Good luck. What do we got? You have Holy Spirit. How many of you have been saved at least 48 hours? You've been a Christian for at least 48 hours. How many of you are going to get saved in the next five minutes? Okay, I'll just see a hand. (laughs) Brother, I thought you were saved. Um... You've been saved for at least 40. This thing isn't about him having to develop you cognitively so that he can use you practically on the earth. This thing is all about you recognizing that you are a temple, a habitat of divinity. And he has created you to host him so that through you, you can reveal him. Now, let me talk to you about, your, about the potential of this. Um, uh, I was in Indonesia back in the day. I took my family in 2016. I was called into ministry in Indonesia. And Indonesians are very, very spiritual, far more so than Americans, um, especially Indonesian businessmen. Now, if you get outside of the, uh, the Muslim parts of, of Indo and you get into more of the uh, outer parts and you go to uh, some of these nice hotels and nice restaurants, and I'm talking nice, like there are some nice, nice places. And our money goes a long way, so it's a, it's a fun place to go, okay? In front of some of these incredibly prosperous hotels are these big statues. Oftentimes, they're cut out of wood. And these, these wooden statues are demons. And these business owners have dedicated their businesses to these demons because they believe that in giving their business to this demon, it will protect them and bring prosperity upon their business. But at the end of the day, these businessmen, they know what you and I know. These are not actual demons. This is just wood that's been carved. This is just stone that's been carved. But why does it have power? Because certainly it does have power. And certainly there are, there are stories where you hear of the demonic power within these nations. Okay, Why do these things have power when it's just a piece of stone or just a piece of wood that's been carved. The reason why they have power is because they are image bearers of the real thing. They have been carved in the image and likeness of the spiritual entity that it is representing. And through simple faith in an inanimate object that's been given over supernaturally to a deity, these Businesses are able to supernaturally prosper because of this demonic realm. My friend, this is a counterfeit of the real thing. We do not need stone statues. We do not need wood statues. In fact, if you've bought wood statues from another country that's a demon, you should probably get it out of your house. And in doing so, that might probably get some of the hell that you've been experiencing out of your house with it. Okay, glad we had that conversation. But it's art, it's demonic, kick it out, all right? 
It's a stinking demon. You don't want a demon in your home, but it's an Aztec and get it out. Good, I'm glad we talked. That's stone, that's wood, and yet it possesses significant demonic power. My friend, you are the real thing. You are the image bearer of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And you're not a corrupted image bearer because of what Christ Jesus has done on the cross, that he has dealt the blow to sin, sickness, and disease. That even Jesus said that whosoever would believe in me would never die. Never die? Never die. But you will live forever. You will one day get to take off the corruptible and put on your immortal new suit and we will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. But you even now have taken on his holiness and his righteousness. You're an image bearer. And if businessmen were smart, they would hire you to stand outside of their business and represent the kingdom of God outside of their business. Why? Because of the access that you have to the Father. We should have people calling us up. Hey, I don't believe in what you believe in, but I need some protection because I got some people coming after me. And the protection they need is not your concealed yada yada fill in the blank. The protection that they need is the glory of God that has been seated inside of. The problem is we don't know who we are. The problem is we're still running off of mosaic systems and thinking and we're not living from an active dynamic of fellowship with Christ Jesus, the spirit, and this place of getting our blueprints from our heavenly papa, from our heavenly daddy. So I got out of bed and I even took a shower this morning because I love you. I do it once a week. I, I came here today to remind you that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And he created you in his own image and likeness to establish his glory through you, that through you and even through your imperfection and even through your weakness that you would be able to reveal and re-manifest and represent I'm yelling again <laughs> you can do it Dan to represent him on the earth full authority full authority full authority full authority full authority full authority Yes, over the fishes of the sea, and yes, over the birds of the air, and yes, the Lord has given us this thing, and yet we've given it over to the tree huggers. Why do the tree huggers love the earth, and, and Christians are just like, can't wait to get off this thing. I can't wait to get off this. Sister, this thing is a gift from God. It's called the earth. Seattle is a gift from God. LA is a gift from God. These are gifts from God. Let's figure it out. Let's figure out this gift. Let's figure out DNA. Let's figure it out um, uh, uh, d diseases. Let's figure this stuff. What if, I believe, I believe, I believe, because I'm a believer, I can't help myself. I believe that we're coming into a time that even when plagues and sickness and famine are released and even crazy bioweapons are released on the earth, there will be a people that are so inhabiting the heavenlies that they see it coming and they have already been working with scientists, Christian scientists, but not the weird ones. <laughs> so that even before bioterrorists can release a weapon, the kingdom of God already has the cure. And I could geek out and I could tell you story after story after story of examples where God has done this throughout human history of using believers within science and education and all these different kinds of places. But it's time that the church of Jesus Christ stop whining and start showing up. That we show up. And we show up to serve, and we show up to give, and we show up saying, I've got something, I've got program, I've got education, I've got these different things, and I've got the glory of God to compensate in all my areas of weakness. Image. Image, image. It's not about your image. It's about revealing his image. There's a battle for your image. Bobby Connor, he'll be here in March. And when we give Bobby a water, because we try to keep him hydrated, <laughs> he, what will he do? Immediately, within seconds, he'll have this thing off of the water. And to me, you know, it's like a minute to win it. I would fail. I would be like. And I'm being serious right now. Like, okay. 
Like that took way too long. All right, you watch Bobby. Okay, don't, don't embarrass him, but you watch him. He'll get a water. He'll sit down. Worship will be going. He'll be watching the worship team. His eyes will be sparkling. And with one hand, he'll, he'll sit there with his bottle and go, look, I didn't even get the whole thing either. <laughs> he'll, he'll go, and it'll be gone. First thing he'll do is he'll remove the label from his water bottle. I've seen him do that for years. I'm like, what's up with that? So I asked him, I said, Bobby, why do you, why do you always take the label off, off your water bottle? He says, well, I'll tell you. I'm not really into labels. You see, I'll tell you, the world, they want to put their labels on you. And that's why all these young people, they, they wear their labels. Because those labels have an agenda. He goes, and I don't want anything to do with that agenda. So that's why I don't do labels. On day six, God created all the land-dwelling creatures. And then he said, it's time for our master creation. Sons and daughters who have our resemblance, who have our likeness. And they will represent in the physical another realm and reality. And the day will come when these two realms come together. When heaven and earth comes together. The day will come when there is a great restoration between these two places. That's what Eden was. We're going to get into that Garden of Eden. That's what it was. It was, a, it was, the, it was the place of conver- convergence between the literal physical heavens and the literal physical earth. And it was the place where God abided. Right there. In, in the, it, was a, it was a literal physical dwelling place. And there was Eden, and in Eden, God put a garden. Well, we're out of time. Let's stand. <laughs> Just to clear, I'm taking off the labels this year. <laughs> Honey, you don't know me. You don't know me. You, you, you know 2020 me. You know 2021 You don't know. You know, like we got to stop saying this. I just got to be me. No, you don't. You don't even know you. You don't even know you. Well, yeah, I do. I've lived with myself. No, no, no. You are a different you today than you were yesterday. Man, if, if you still know me in five years, you know, which some of you will have the, the, the blessed luxury of, of having that, you're going to be like, who are you? You're nothing like 2021, dear. Wow. When I'm around you, it's like being around Jesus. When I hear you, it's like listening to a Jesus MP3. When I shake your hand, it's like, it's like I'm shaking the hand of Jesus. Who the heck are you? I have, I have no idea. It's not me, it's him. This is what God's doing in you. To break, he's breaking us off of the system and bringing us into himself. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is what's happening within the culture. There's like a rage against systems, but you can't rage against him. You can't rage against this shepherd, this father, this, this lover. We are about to unroll a scroll that hasn't been seen even by a generation. It's time for awakening. It's time for revival. It's time for harvest. That The gospel hasn't even, that we have unreached people groups in Seattle. We have unreached people. I, I've shared the gospel with kids in Seattle and they, they've never heard the gospel. They've never heard the stories of Jesus. They've never even heard about Noah's Ark. And I'm like, and, and they're born here in, 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 in America. What does that mean? It means it's been far too long since we've seen a great awakening in our country. It's been far too long since we've seen a massive harvest in the Pacific Northwest. We are past due for the big one. We are past due for the big one. And this next move of God will not be about the man of God. This next move of God will be about the body. It'll be about the image of Christ. It'll be about covenanting covenanting together to establish and to protect his image. His image is everything. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you and we worship you. You are good and your steadfast love endures forever. For the sake of Seattle, burn like a fire in us. For the sake of our families, burn like a fire in us. Burn. Burn in us, Lord. We surrender this year to you. We surrender our dreams to you. We surrender our disappointments to you. We, we surrender our past to you. We don't want to drag the damage of the past into this year, Lord.
We want to be true image bearers, just like Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen him. If you've heard from me, you've heard from him. Use this house, use this room. Use our hands, our feet, use our tongues. If there's any way possible, use our Facebook pages and Instagram. If there's any way possible. Use our children, use our grandchildren to reveal your goodness and your mercy, to reveal your father heart. Lord, use us to unroll a scroll of the gospel into the fabric of Seattle, Washington. The people would be treated with dignity, not because of a law, but because of the fear of God. That people wouldn't have abortions, not because it's been forbidden by legislation, but because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that this region steps into the awareness of Father God and our our role, this place of you partnering with your creation to create that from the earth would come forth the righteous who execute justice for your perfect glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's, it's like mind, it's mind-blowing stuff, isn't it? It's just, it's, who knew? It's been in Genesis this entire time. Listen, we love you. Uh, we do have a six o'clock service. Uh, tonight we begin a new series called The Interrupters, uh, a study of the men and women who brought heaven to earth. Um, tonight we're going to begin with the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Peter. We're going to be studying the, the apostles first, then going into the, the mystic saints including the Desert Fathers, then going into 19th century, um, uh, 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 healing evangelists, William Branham, A.A. Allen, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, all the way going into present day, modern day supernaturalists. So this is a long-term series of the history of the supernatural within our great faith, and it all begins tonight. So six o'clock, love you guys. If you need prayer for anything, come on up. We'd love to pray for you, okay? God bless.